Thank you all for joining us today. Please welcome National Public Radio's correspondent, Diplomacy Foreign Desk, Michelle Kellerman. Yes, hi everybody. It's very nice to be here. Um, uh, welcome to our discussion, Russia's war in Ukraine impacts on the global, on the international order or disorder. We have three really great uh, Russia hands here and I'm gonna introduce them shortly, but first a, a few words about myself and why I'm here. I guess the most important thing with this crowd is that I'm a CMU parent. My son is a sophomore studying environmental engineering. So if you uh, know Nico Bosque, tell him his mom says hi. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, I cover the State Department for NPR and I'm actually here in my State Department booth, which is kind of drab and nothing like this nice Zoom background of NPR's uh, main headquarters. I wish I were there, but I, I, I'm i here at the State Department today, so greetings. Um, I've been on this beat since my son was born, so a, a very long time, but I started my career in Moscow. It was the end of Boris Yeltsin's time in office, um, the beginning of Putin. I saw his rise to power, his consolidation uh, over the media, his consolidation of power, um, the second Chechen war, the devastation um, that the Russian troops uh, created in Grozny. I went there with the Russian military after that happened. So seen a lot over the years, um, but still, you know, to this day, I'm surprised at how far Russia has gone in this war in Ukraine. So we have just a lot of talk to talk about, um, you know, what Russia's goals are now, uh, how the international community is responding. Um, and, you know, I really want to, to, to raise some of these things before, before I, I introduce the partners, the, the other speakers, I would like to say a little bit about one of the last um, kind of series of stories that I did, and this was back in 2001 from Moscow, uh, was about how Russians really were not coming to terms with their Soviet past, the Soviet atrocities and little did I know that this sort of revisionism of history would be would play such a big role in a modern day conflict. Uh, so a lot to talk about. Um, if you have questions during this time, uh, use the Q&A feature to submit um, questions, uh, mention it who you want to answer or if you want anyone to answer and I will read those questions when we get there. But we're going to begin with um, James Goldgeier. He's a professor of international relations and the um, former dean of the School of International Service at American University. And um, I'd just like to kick it off with one thought, Jim. You know, when Putin annexed Crimea, stirred up the conflict in the Donbass in 2014, he pretty much got away with it. But this time he's seen a much more united international uh, response. And I wonder um, if you think that this war has really given NATO, for instance, a new lease on life. Well, thanks, Michelle. And thanks to CMU for the invitation. And uh, um, certainly there's nothing that brings NATO together like Russian aggression. I mean, NATO has searched for new missions uh, since the end of the Cold War and has of course expand to 30 members and now perhaps soon to 32 with the addition of Sweden and Finland. Um, and anytime those other missions uh, ha have arisen uh, in front of NATO, NATO, it's done lots of things, the Balkan wars, uh, the war against Kosovo, uh, Serbia in 1999, um, the, the mission in Afghanistan, uh, humanitarian relief, counter piracy, all sorts of things. You know, there's always debate within NATO, but when it comes to Russian aggression, that's something that all of the countries um, come around together, uh, come together around uh, the need to, to counter Russian aggression. You are right, the 2014 Russian war uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, it resulted in sanctions. Uh, but it, there wasn't a particularly tough response. There was the United States, for example, the Obama administration provided non-lethal military assistance. 
Uh, but this widening of the war and especially the brutality of it in 2022 uh, has really uh, unified the alliance. We're seeing the strengthening of support for the Eastern members. Uh, we have member states, of course, supplying Ukraine with what it needs uh, to help it defend itself. Germany's announcement of a significant increase in, in defense spending. And as I mentioned before, the, the Swedish and Finnish uh, clear interest in, in joining NATO, the populations in those countries uh, supporting that in a way they had not previously. I mean, that, that is all due to this, um, this horrific uh, Russian war, uh, expansion of a war that started in 2014. I wanna take us back to um, April 1993, uh, just prior to the first meeting between President Bill Clinton and President Boris Yeltsin. Uh, and Bill Clinton gave a speech explaining why he was seeking support from Congress for a major assistance package to Russia and actually the other uh, republics that had emerged from the Soviet Union. Uh, and it is worth remembering, yes, the United States did provide assistance to Russia. Uh, and Clinton uh, explained that Russia was going through three major transitions uh, from authoritarianism to democracy from communism to capitalism, and from empire to nation state. Uh, the US hoped uh, after the collapse of the USSR that Russia would become a post-imperial state. It's worth remembering that when the republics like Ukraine sought their independence in 1991, declared their independence in 1991, uh, Russian President Yeltsin supported those efforts because he was in his own domestic political battle against Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, and he was trying to bring the USSR down. So he needed these republics, including Russia, to become independent. And Yeltsin took a, a much more pro-Western, pro-democracy, pro-market position than Gorbachev, because that was what he needed to win in that domestic political battle and gain the support of the West. But even his views of the independence of these countries had its limits. And in 1997, when NATO was really getting, moving forward with the process of its enlargement, it would take Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic uh, as new members in 1999. Um, but in 1997, moving forward with this and, and the moving for, forward with the NATO-Russia Founding Act, which tried to create some uh, assurances for Russia that this was not directed against it. Um, Yeltsin asked for, but did not receive an agreement from Clinton that none of the former Soviet republics and especially Ukraine would be able to join NATO. And Clinton argued in response that what Yeltsin was proposing would mean, quote, Russia would be saying, we've still got an empire but it just can't reach as far west, end quote. So, th so this has been a big deal for the United States and Russia um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Putin has been very clear for a long time on his views, for example, um, you know, 15 years ago that, that Ukraine isn't a real country, uh, his views that Ukraine belongs to Russia, and this is a view that's just been anathema to the United States and its Western allies. It runs counter to the principles of the Helsinki Final Act signed in 1975. Uh, Russia is a signatory. Uh, and the Helsinki Final Act says borders should not be changed by force and countries have the right to choose their own futures. And so when I hear in recent weeks, US officials saying the goal is to isolate and weaken Russia, so that it can't repeat this war against Ukraine in the future. What I hear is basically a statement that, okay, Russia didn't choose to become a post-imperial state on its own. So the US is going to try to make it become one by degrading its capability so that it can no longer force its will on its neighbors. I agree with the policy, although keep front and center that what we most want is to ensure that Ukraine becomes a free and independent country without Russian troops uh, on its territory. Um, I'm not sure that the Biden administration needed to say this out loud. Um, I do think it complicates maintaining a coalition 
that supports the effort by the Ukrainians to defend themselves against this brutality. And I just want to close by saying that, you know, as late as January, there were still U.S. officials holding out hope that Putin would want to negotiate new arms control agreements, cooperate on confidence building measures, things that would address Russian security concerns as well as those of countries like Ukraine and Estonia and Poland. Um, and obviously that hope is gone. Any, any idea that Russia can be part of this European security framework, something that has been sought by the West since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but that's been shattered by the magnitude and brutality of this war. Thank you. A lot to think about there. And I, I just have to laugh when you were mentioning the 1993 aid to Russia, because I was actually um, a student back then and volunteered to go out to the airport and help with this stuff. And all I remember was boxes and boxes of Skittles in, so in, in U.S. military planes. So I'm not sure the U.S. really met the moment. Um, I'm gonna turn now to um, uh, Ambassador Sarah Mendelson. She's the head of the CMU's uh, Heinz College here in Washington, DC and a, a professor of public policy. We've known each other for a long time. Uh, she served in the Obama administration, including at the um, US mission to the UN. Um, so maybe we can start uh, your, your conversation there. Um, you know, this is clearly, um, uh, a violation of the UN Charter, um, a lot of angst up there at the United Nations, but what can the UN really do when, when you have a, a, a Security Council member, a permanent Security Council member, Russia uh, at the center of it all? Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I just wanna associate myself with the US foreign assistance. I worked for the National Democratic Institute in Moscow, 94-95. <clears throat> and was with USAID when um, Foreign Minister Lavrov told Secretary Clinton that USAID would be leaving Moscow in 20 days after 20 years. So it's important to remember that uh, things have been closing space and, and Russia has, uh, has had a long history. Um, I do th think this is a moment of absolute crisis for the UN. Uh, there's no question that um, the UN Charter is at risk, uh, but it's a little bit surprising to me that it's taken this long for people to realize the kind of attitude that Putin has for international humanitarian and human rights law. We have seen flaunting of the rules-based system ever since he came on the international scene in 1999. Uh, the second war in Chechnya, Georgia, Syria, Ukraine starting in 2014. Uh, and the international community's response was much less, uh, it was much more muted. Um, and he, I think, assumed that that would be the same international response in 2022, but it hasn't been. Um, it's been, there have been three ways in which the international community has articulated its views at the UN. Uh, which gives us a sense of, of this, the strength of the, the, the response. So on March 2nd, there was an initial vote in the General Assembly with an astonishing 141 countries um, in support or articulating their horror at Russia's aggression in Ukraine, five against and 35 abstained. There was a historic vote April 7th where Russia was kicked out of the Human Rights Council it, the votes went down though, vote 93 to get Russia out, 24 against having Russia kicked out and 58 abstentions. And most re recently, April 26th, there was a very important vote and this really goes to the heart of your question, Liechtenstein, which uh, as a mission has long played a role that is larger than its small population size, larger role at the UN than its population size. Liechtenstein succeeded in getting a resolution at the General Assembly, which means that any time a permanent member of the Security Council uses their veto power, they then within 10 working days have to come to the General Assembly and explain their vote. 
This is the closest we've ever gotten to any kind of, in the US, by the way, and the UK and France supported this resolution, co-sponsored the resolution. This is as close as we've gotten for years in addressing what has been a, an enormous logjam in the Security Council. Um, but let me just articulate a few other ways in which the international community is expressing solidarity with Ukraine, but then a, a few worries that go well beyond the United Nations. There are 43 countries now in a contact group that will meet monthly at the ministerial level to coordinate uh, arms for Ukraine. Um, so the Euro-Atlantic and beyond uh, as a community is quite strong. There's been huge movement on um, beginning to get off the fossil fuels from Russia. There's a lot more movement on corruption and addressing the illicit flow of money that is in many of our countries that comes from Russia. But I still worry about the abstentions. You know, those abstentions grew, as I said, from 35 March 2nd to 58 uh, on April 7th. Um, and I confess to being a little bit confused by it. The, the, the abstention, in, in part because this war is so much broader than a war in Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine. It's, in, it's influencing um, spikes in food insecurity worldwide. It has, it's going to have a huge impact on the continent of Africa. Most decisively, it has impacts on economic growth and sustainable development around the world, including in India. Um, but it's also, it is fundamentally, as Tim Snyder has called it, a colonial war where, quote, empire enforces objectification, in this case of Ukraine, on the periphery and amnesia at the center. Uh, and you noted, Michelle, the role of, of memory. Uh, I want to I draw everyone's attention to the liquidation in December of the Russian NGO Memorial that both documented Russian military casualties in numerous wars, but also documented and held up the memory of the victims of Stalin. None of that is legal today in, in Russia. So all of this means that the future of the international rules-based order is on the line, and it depends on the course of the war, particularly accountability for the crimes that we've seen. We've witnessed crimes of aggression, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and if they're not prosecuted and held accountable, we're not gonna have, we're gonna have a lot more international disorder if there's spillover into NATO countries, we're gonna have a wider war uh, and further international order will depend on winning that war. If it's prolonged, um, it's you know, dependent on getting to a post-Putin Russia and the accountability piece. I see what I call a Bucha or Mariupol effect. Those of us who have seen what has happened in part thanks to very brave journalists and citizens, we can't unsee it and it affects our view of Russia and the Kremlin. But for those who are inside Russia who don't believe this, or they believe what they're seeing in an assault on so-called Nazis and not peaceful citizens, they're in a different place in a different era. And as more information comes out about Russia's war in Ukraine, about the filtration camps, the forced migration of women and children from Ukraine into Russia, of rape as an instrument of war, this is gonna divide us even more uh, and threaten international order. Thank you. Okay, so food insecurity, international disorder, um, uh, step back from democracy, human rights. I wonder if that's what, if that's what Putin's after here. Uh, you know, I wanna bring in uh, Brian Taylor. He's a leading researcher on Vladimir Putin and. Putinism. Um, he's a professor at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Um, you know, obviously, no one really can get in the head of Vladimir Putin, but we're going <laughs> to at least try to get the sense of, you know, what's he trying to accomplish here at this point? I mean, I was among those who really thought he could have been dissuaded uh, before he went in, but now I'm reading um, Snyder's book road to unfreedom and it seems like this was all you know this was he was heading in this direction and and there wasn't any stopping him um there he, he's poised now to to call this a war rather than a special military operation at least that's what people 
think he might do around the the, the May 9th uh, Victory Day celebrations. What What's he trying to accomplish at this point in time? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I, I think the point that you made a, a bit earlier about how these are some old and enduring ideas is a really important one. So I'm going to make uh, three basic points in my remarks. First, that Putin really has no interest in preserving the current international order. He resents it and wants it to be replaced. The second point I wanna make is that his preferred order would be based on a great power spheres of influence rather than the current system. And the third point is that his preferred order would be a big step uh, backwards for the international community. So on the first point, he has no interest in preserving this order. He resents it, wants it to be replaced. He has made that clear repeatedly in speeches over the years. He believes what the US and its allies and others call the international order is just a fig leaf for what one of his close associates called total world domination by the United States. Uh, Putin made a very famous speech, I'm sure you'll remember at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, where he referred to a world of, quote, one boss, uh, one center of power, one center of force, one center of decision making, a world of one boss and of one sovereign. He has repeatedly uh, denounced the US for seeking world domination, uh, compared it to Big Brother from 1984, uh, for not having allies but vassals, uh, and even claimed that the US has supported quote, neo-Nazis and Islamic radicals to support its goals and of constantly interfering in all issues in the world. So Putin fundamentally doesn't believe Western leaders when they tell him that the era of great power spheres of influence is in the past. Uh, he doesn't believe this talk about international order and international law. Uh, as one Russian journalist put it, uh, Putin thinks that all this talk is just a fig leaf for what's really going on which is that Western leaders want to divide up the world without him and leave Russia without a slice. So he's been talking about these ideas for a very long time, and now we're seeing uh, them in action to a certain extent uh, with the invasion of Ukraine. So the second point, he would prefer a world order based on great power spheres of influence. Uh, speaking of the UN, he made this clear at his address to the UN General Assembly in 2015, where he started his speech by hailing the Yalta Agreement between the big three of Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill that established the rules of the game for the post-World War II order. And in Putin's understanding of this world, great powers have spheres of influence. Small states take what the great powers are willing to give them, but don't have their own voice. And democracy and human rights are simply not matters of importance in issues of great power politics. Uh, a few months before Yalta, there was an infamous uh, meeting between Stalin and Churchill in, in Moscow, where they came to this so-called percentages agreement, where they informally agreed on a note written by Churchill to the percentage of influence the Soviet Union and the West would have in five different East European states. And I think that's an international order that Putin could get behind, where Russia is part of a new big three, and he and President Biden and uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping decide everything over the heads of smaller uh, countries. That would be an order that he would be comfortable with. And the third point is this preferred order would be a big step backward. And I think it's for this reason we're seeing things like what Sarah mentioned in terms of the, the vote in the General Assembly. Uh, trying to make sure that this invasion fails. Uh, in particular, there's an important norm about territorial integrity that's part of the current global order. Uh, and as has been mentioned, Russia's party to multiple agreements. I count at least six, either international, multilateral, or bilateral with Ukraine that promise to respect Ukrainian borders and its territorial integrity as it was at the time Ukraine became independent uh, in 1992. Uh, but in Putin's mind, history can justify all sorts of sins. And I think it would be chaos if we tried to go back to uh, the maps of 100 or 200 years ago to satisfy Putin's one-sided reading of Russian and Ukrainian history. And I want to 
close just by calling attention to the remarks of the Kenyan ambassador to the UN uh, in February after the invasion, where he noted that African countries settled for borders that they inherited, and if they hadn't, that they would still be waging bloody wars. And he said, rather than looking ever backward into history with dangerous nostalgia, we chose to look forward. We chose to follow the rules. We must complete our recovery from the embers of dead empires in a way that does not plunge us back into new forms of domination and oppression. Okay, so um, I'd like everybody to turn on their cameras and we can have a discussion now. We have very little time. I, I wanna get to the uh, questioners, but just first of all, it, it, before, I just wanna leave you one, with one other question, um, Dr. Taylor, and that is, um, you know, there's so much talk in Washington that this could be the end of Putin. There could be some sort of palace intrigue. You know, it, it seems far-fetched to me, but you know, he did, he spent all these years creating this vertical of, of power, as he calls it. Um, I went, I went back to Russia for the World Cup, and it, I was amazed to see how Moscow was doing. I mean, yeah, no democracy, but the places look amazing. Um, the, the oil revenue that was pouring in, I mean, Russians were doing well, and he risked it all by this. And I wonder if you think that this. Um, system that he created survives him somehow. Uh, if there's any chance of having some sort of palace coup, it seems very unlikely to me. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Michelle. So political scientists who study regimes like Putin say they face two basic threats, one from what we might call the elites, a palace coup, and one from what we can call the streets, the, the possibility of popular revolution. And I think you're right that neither of these presents a real threat to him as far as we can tell at the moment. But I would also say the chance of either of these threats to him was zero before February 24th, 2022. And the chance has gone up uh, for either of those threats, uh, but not sure really how much so. Um, political scientists uh, have noted that Personalist leaders like Putin who've been in power a very long time, who are, who are quite old, they often die in office. About half the time they die in office and they often stay in power for you know, 30, 35 years. So uh, I, I think the, the smart bet is probably that he survives this, uh, but these types of regimes are often very stable until they are not. Uh, and the second most common way for leaders like this to, to exit the scene is not dying in office, but popular revolution. And we know that occasionally major economic catastrophes, which Russia could be facing, defeat in a stupid war of choice. Those have been ways that have threatened rulers hold uh, on power uh, in the past. So this may or may not be the beginning of the end, but I think it really is the end of the the claim that Putinism has been some sort of great success, your reference to you know, how Moscow looked in 2018. Uh, I, I feel like many of the achievements that, that were there uh, in the post-Soviet period have been unwound because of this war. Uh, and Russia is facing uh, economic stagnation, economic depression, and global isolation. I, and I see, frankly, little hope for positive development as long as Putin's in power. Yeah. Um, and then Jim and Sarah, I'll just throw this other kind of broad question to to you two before we turn to questioners from uh, the viewers. Um, you know, the mantra of the Cold War era has been this Europe whole and free, but I feel like the West never figured out how to connect Russia into that. Or, you know, I mean, it was, it was Putin doing his own thing, obviously, but it, we never sort of figured out how to do that. The Germans tried with trade and more dependence on Russian energy, um, and that's collapsed. Uh, so what now? You know, well, there's still going to be a big power with well, nuclear well, weapons. How do you, how do you, and there's well, still going to be neighbors to Ukraine. Well, I mean, you know, it is, it is a great question and it, it is worth noting, I, I think that this, the, the Europe whole and free idea, which was um, enunciated by George H.W. Bush in West Germany in May of 1989 and really helped guide 
um, all sorts of policies that the United States pursued afterward to try to help, you know, um, create a, a, zone, a, a larger zone of peace and prosperity, sort of moving from west to east after the end of the Cold War and included policies like NATO enlargement and EU enlargement and efforts to, to connect with Russia in that order through things like the Partnership for Peace. I mentioned the NATO-Russia Founding Act when that was signed in 1997, the idea was, okay, we're, we're enlarging NATO for reasons that we're not trying to threaten Russia. And so we're gonna make commitments uh, to try to ease Russia's concerns. I, I think when we look back, the, the problem was that, I mean, as you say, we didn't really find a place for Russia in that order. We, we were determined to maintain NATO, to extend NATO, to use NATO, um, partly because that was the way the US has a role to play in Europe. Uh, it's not a member of the European Union. And we didn't really plan, find a place for Russia in that order other than to create an effort to create a NATO-Russia relationship. And Russia never found a place for itself uh, in that order. And actually, you know, we talk about NATO enlargement. I think the, the big, big breaking point was the Kosovo War in 1999 when NATO went to war uh, against Serbia over Russian objections, no UN Security Council authorization. And again, of course, four years later, the United States went to war against Iraq with no UN Security Council authorization. I, you know, the color revolutions. I mean, there was just a lot of policies that kept, that, that just didn't allow this coming together. And so as you say, like, now what? And I think, you know, there was an effort on the part of the West to try to find a way to include Russia without giving up NATO. Now I don't see how we'll pursue that effort at all. As Brian says, I mean, as long as Putin's in power, the sanctions are on, you know, the United States has announced its goal is to isolate and weaken Russia. I think its goal is just, okay, keep Russia from threatening Europe, contain it. And is that a long-term, viable long-term strategy for a country of Russia's size and with the nuclear weapons it has? I don't think it's a viable long-term strategy, but, you know, the earlier containment lasted for 40 years. So, um, Maybe that's that's where we're at. So I want to say that this has been the shattering of the conception of of having to integrate Russia into the international system. But the truth is that if we looked at Russia's engagement with a whole variety of international organizations, Russia influenced those international organizations more than the international organizations influenced Russian behavior. Um, whether it's the OSCE, Council of Europe. I mean, the, the courts in Europe have been choked with cases of human rights abuse from Russia. Uh, have, they've just gone up. They haven't affected Russians' behavior. But I wanna agree with Jim. I remember when the war started in March, 1999, uh, the bombing of Kosovo. And it is said by some colleagues that that's exactly when the general staff in Russia started to plot the second war in Chechnya, that they felt that there is no international law, there is no international humanitarian law, and we can do what we want to do. And then months later, um, that second war started. But I, I also want to say, let's not write off all foreign assistance as disaster or it didn't work. It didn't work in Russia. And we could see that, we could see that quite some time ago. I remember walking uh, with a colleague, uh, Steve Solnick, in Petersburg in fall 2006, and we were in the cemetery where the dead are buried from the siege of Leningrad during World War II, and he turned to me and he said, you know, it's never going to happen in our professional lifetime, meaning a democratic Russia, uh, and that's about the time that both of us started thinking about what other things are we going to focus on, but if, you know, set aside Russia, look at all these other countries. I mean, Estonia also was a recipient of US assistance. Uh, Ukraine, I mean, Ukrainians have been looking West for quite some time. And so I think the conception of Europe whole and free is one that is still valid. It just isn't with Russia. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to go to a couple of the pre um, submitted questions before I go to the newer ones, um, because one is something that you mentioned earlier, Sarah, and that is about um, uh, the dependence on oil and, and Russian energy uh, now going down. Uh, this questioner asked why it took so long for that to happen. Um, why weren't these steps taken sooner? Uh, couldn't that have prevented the invasion? Um, you know, because we saw what Russia did in 2014 combined with the threat of uh, the climate crisis, why were Europeans doing waited so late? And the other question was about um, the, what they call the disproportionate political media and social attention on the invasion of Ukraine compared to so many other crises around the world, Tigray, Afghanistan, Libya, Rakhine, the list goes on. So whether or not you're worried that this um, distracts from all these other crises going on in the world. And maybe those are both questions for you. So on the, on the fossil fuel side, uh, I would say, first of all, Germany played a very large role in this. And we should have, I think, pushed much harder on the Germans uh, and all the Europeans. We should have had an energy policy that recognized the need for independence from Russian gas and oil. Uh, for a long time, those of us who focus on human rights have wondered, wouldn't it be a bolster to our foreign policy if we had independence from Saudi Arabia, from from Russia, I mean, what that would be quite, uh, I mean, never mind climate change and the, the reasons to do that. From a human rights perspective, there are lots of reasons to do that. Um, so I think the era of, and this is a huge impact for Russian, the Russian economy, which is so heavily dependent on its gas and oil revenues. Um, it's taking a while to turn the ship. Um, but the sooner the ship turns and those revenues are cut off, then the funding for the war is cut off. So it's extremely important um, that we get a fossil fuel Europe uh, or a, a different kind of energy uh, distribution to the Europeans. And I think the Biden administration is very focused on, on delivering. On the attention to these other crises, first of all, we've just seen Ukraine knocked off the headlines um, today, yesterday, uh, because of US domestic news. Um, the longer this war goes on, the more that's gonna happen and the less coverage this is gonna have. I would argue because this is an imperial war, this is a country, this is Russia trying to destroy Ukraine and Ukrainians, that there is a, there's a way in which this war is, is perhaps, um, somewhat different. Uh, there's another question I think that there, there are a lot of different wars that have gone on, right? There's Iraq, there's Libya, there's Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, and all of those different wars have different reasons for being. I wouldn't lump them into all one thing. Um, it's extremely important to understand the context and the details, uh, and it's extremely important to understand the context and the details of this war and why it is in some ways different, but the truth is there are multiple crises going on around the world. Uh, and of course we need to be <laughs> paying attention to, to all of them, which is very difficult. Um, but uh, it is also again, a reason why I think the United Nations uh, and the humanitarian organizations that are funded by the United Nations are under enormous strain. They've been under enormous strain because of COVID the food uh, insecurity that's spiking um, and conflict. Um, so, you know, I, yes. <laughs> so there, there are a few, uh, several questions about the, a little bit more about Putin and the, um, the succession that have, are coming in. So these are perhaps for Brian. Um, this one says, historically, Russian and Soviet leaders have either died in office, Lenin, Stalin, Brezhnev, or sent to permanent vacation, Khrushchev. Uh, later vo left voluntarily Gorbachev or have been given an unlimited tab at the bar, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, can Putin go out of office still alive and kicking or is he too dangerous a person to have around when he leaves office? Is uh, death natural or otherwise the only way he relinquishes power? And related to that, um, how strong is the succession hierarchy within the Kremlin? If he were to die, um, 
you know, what happens, we talked a little bit about this already, but what happens to um, Putinism? Uh, does this political system change or is it there to stay? Uh, th those are great questions. So on, on the first one, is there a scenario in, in which he leaves uh, when he hasn't died in office? You know, we've talked about the coup scenario, the revolution scenario, which I think in the short term are, are not particularly likely um, and only become more likely depending on the course of the war and depending on the course of uh, the, the Russian economy. Uh, but it's interesting that you know, a few years ago, there was a big debate about whether Putin was going to leave office voluntarily and sort of line up his successor, what all the maneuvering was ar around amending the constitution to give him the possibility of staying longer and that kind of thing. And I think that question has been answered. He's staying, uh, you know, for the long term. Uh, and so either he, he leaves, uh, excuse the expression, in a box, or, you know, he, he's removed in some way. The only sort of slight wrinkle on that would be if for health reasons, he understands he doesn't have much time left and he wants to set up the succession in a way that makes uh, his person, whoever he decides that person is, the, the next person in charge. Uh, and so this takes us to the second question about what are the rules? Uh, and in personalist dictatorships like this, there often aren't that many rules about succession, which is why Often these regimes, after the leader falls, they end up falling. Uh, within five years, more than half of personalist autocracies, uh, when the leader dies in office, collapse in, in some sense. And so some kind of new ruling group comes to power. Uh, but there is one specific rule that I think would kind of orient elite battles over what comes next, and that's the prime minister succeeds the president if the president is incapacitated or dead. And so. In the current scenario, that would be the Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin, who is a bit of a wild card, I think, and was seen as a technocrat when he came in, uh, but would have the inside track if, if you know something unexpected happened, the same way that Vladimir Putin had the inside track at the end of 1999 when Boris Yeltsin suddenly resigned. And that kind of cleared the way for Putin. So we can imagine a scenario like that in which all the other elites kind of coalesce around the next person. And even if they're not totally happy, uh, it would be safer to do that than to sort of come out openly against uh, the new guy. So they would live to fight another day. Um, there's a couple of questions I, I wanna to put to you, Jim, now. One, one is, um, you know, the upcoming May 9th Victory Day uh, whether that's a potential inflection point, uh, whether Putin might expand or escalate the war as, as many have been suggesting. Um, and then also, secondly, if you could talk a little bit about the um, relationship between Russia and China. Um, the US has been warning uh, China not to aid um, Russia militarily. And so far they say they, they haven't seen that actually. And maybe there are limits to this unlimited friendship that the Putin and, and Xi Jinping announced uh, earlier this year. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are focused on May 9th. Um, and I, I think, of course, for that victory parade, uh, he's and the celebration of, of the victory over Nazi Germany, he's going to want to um, tie that to his uh, effort to denazify Ukraine, as he puts it, um, this this just gross um, conversation that the that the Russians are having, Foreign Minister Lavrov, on the you know, um, sure Zelensky could be a Nazi, Hitler had Jewish blood, and all. That. I mean, it's just been just grotesque uh, the kind of conversation coming out. But I, I mean, I think at this point, what Putin's focused on is figuring out like how he can. Um, emerge victorious uh, in this war um, and what that would mean. I mean, obviously his maximalist aims don't uh, seem uh, in, within reach, the goal of, of uh, toppling the government uh, and putting in a puppet regime and controlling much of the country. I mean, he's got his hands full just within Eastern Ukraine and, and securing that area. But, you know, whether we're talking about May 1st, May 9th, May 31st, uh, or, or beyond. I mean, it's, it's the, the goal 
the goal is to try to uh, achieve something that he can that he can call a victory. Um, I, 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 I think this war is going to go on for quite some time. Uh, and I think that um, the Russians will continue to engage in this brutal effort. And I think the Ukrainians will continue to uh, defend themselves and the West will continue to supply uh, Ukraine with what it needs to defend itself. So I, I, don't, um, I don't really put much stock in sort of a particular date other than for him to, um, to tie the victory over the Nazis uh, in 45 with uh, the need to denazify. Michelle, can I just point out two things? One, I'm going to be looking to see who shows up on May 9th. It's said that there are no foreign dignitaries that were invited. Is that true? Uh, I mean, I, I would imagine it's conceivable that somebody's going to show up, but who is it? Um, is is Putin really totally isolated? And the other thing is, um, there's a very interesting, essentially a non-aggression pact that was issued February 4th. It's a, from Russia and China. And it is a very disturbing read. Um, I think China may have come to regret the document um, since they've seen what's happened and the international response. But for um, scholars, students of international relations, it's, a, it's an interesting and important document. Yeah, and just on that, I just tying back to what Brian was saying earlier, um, you know, and your point, your question about Russia-China relationship. I mean, China, what China is invested in is the continuation of Vladimir Putin uh, at the top within Russia. Uh, I mean, they have a leader in Russia who, as Brian said, uh, is out to undermine, um, you know, the U.S. position in the world uh, and the, the U.S. effort to create a certain kind of international order. China is also uh, eager to undermine the United States. They have a partner that's now even more dependent uh, on China uh, than it was before. Uh, but I think what they, what Xi Jinping really doesn't want to see is regime change in Russia. So even if he might be reassured by Brian's remarks uh, that uh, there isn't um, a sort of regime change on the horizon. Um, I mean, I think that's first and foremost his, uh, his probably his major concern. Um, there's a there's a, a kind of human rights related question here about um, whether uh, any of you consider the attacks on Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan uh, uh, humane or inhumane, and whether U.S. former presidents. Uh, or author, who authorize these attacks are not war criminals. Um, I, you know, without getting into sign of what aboutism here, I did say that I meant I did mention earlier that I was in Grozny after the Russians leveled Grozny, but I also saw Raqqa after the U.S. liberated it from ISIS, um, and it it did look very similar. Unfortunately, um, the way wars are waged in this day, uh, you know. Uh, it wasn't exactly specific targeting <laughs> on these things. So I wonder if you have concerns, I mean, whether the, you know, the, the Russians obviously use a lot of these examples, Iraq, et cetera, to justify uh, what they're doing in Ukraine, whether there's any comparison. Well, I want to, I want to focus on Libya for a second, because I think it actually was extremely important in Putin's thinking uh, coming back. So there was a vote in the Security Council on the use of force in Libya uh, in 2011, and Russia abstained um, in the personage of Medvedev. And it was about then that I, we think that Putin said, okay, this is, this is not on and we're gonna flip. I'm gonna come back, of course, which he announced at the end of September, 2011, I'm gonna come back as president and um, Medvedev will be um, prime minister. So I think, the Libya, the UN sanctioned Libya, and of course, this ended with Gaddafi being killed. That's a lightning point for him. I mean, the idea that dictators actually die or are killed is something that he's very um, alarmed by. But as I was saying earlier, all of these different wars and use of force require a much longer uh, discussion than we have time for. Um, and I, I wouldn't fold everybody into one, I mean, to your point about what about -ism, um, just take Afghanistan. I mean, this was internationally sanctioned. It was post 9-11. Clearly, 
there are mistakes that are made. Um, but I, I urge um, folks to get familiar with both international human humanitarian law and international human rights law, but also the degree to which um, the Pentagon also with the State Department is aware of these laws, trains around these laws. Uh, and while we talked earlier about the uh, NATO bombing in, in um, Kosovo, I attended multiple meetings with Human Rights Watch where there is a whole NATO group that was focused on trying to make sure civilians were not targeted. Uh, so while Mr. Putin likes to think that there is no such thing as international humanitarian law, clearly there are mistakes that are made, but there is such a body of law and generally it is, it is followed. And if it's not, then we are in a world that is, uh, looks like Bucha. Well said. Um, there's a question about what, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, to drive home one point, which is that one of the principles of the post-World War II international order that for the most part has been respected and upheld is the prohibition against territorial aggrandizement through military force against a neighbor. That pattern of states just wiping other states off the map and grab, grabbing their territory or part of their territory has largely, not entirely, but largely gone away in the post-1945 world. And the last episode of even close to this scale was the Iraqi attack on Kuwait in, in 1990, which was you know, 30 plus years ago. And here we have the aggressor being you know, one of the world's great powers, a member of the Security Council, a nuclear superpower. So I think the stakes are, are really high here. And in that sense, it is somewhat of a distinct event. Um, there's a question about whether what the likelihood is that this war expands to Moldova or other frozen conflicts. And I wonder who wants to tackle that. I think we're very worried. I mean, Moldova. <laughs> I'm worried about Poland. Uh, I mean, I'm worried about all sorts of mistakes. We're in a very, very highly insecure moment. There's a lot of miscommunication that could happen. Um, but yes, I mean, very worried about Moldova. There's also a question about the general, this is a hard one to answer, but the general consensus of, of the Russian people toward the war, um, whether they're, economic concerns that are may drive uh, how popular or unpopular this war is. I mean, obviously there's a huge uh, discussion to be had about the, the propaganda machine at home in Russia, but who wants to tackle that? I was on a panel recently with um, the head of the Levada Institute, which is the um, most reputable public opinion uh, polling company, um, one that I worked with for over 10 years. Um, and their view is that generally there, there is support um, in the work that I did with the Levada team. The, the military casualties is like many people around the world. That's the thing that is going to drive people away from this war. The degree to which uh, men are coming home, fathers, sons, brothers, cousins, um, dead. Uh, and the degree to which there's some understanding and knowledge about it. I mean, it, it becomes more difficult if the, if the recruits are spread out over Russia and they're not coming from big cities. Um, but generally it, it seems that this war is not unpopular. Yeah, to your point, there was a lot of body bags coming home to places like Buryatia and Dagestan and you know, ethnic minority groups uh, across Russia. You, you know, you asked before about May 9th. I'd be interested to hear from Brian. I mean, there are a lot of people, of course, who are arguing that May 9th, he might announce a national mobilization. I mean, this just seems super risky to me um, to have a national mobilization, just politically risky. Uh, and, you know, in, in, on Sarah's point, I mean, I mean, you you don't want all these folks called up from these major metropolitan areas and then um, potentially be killed in this war. And anyway, with a national mobilization, I mean, you're not, it's not exactly like you're calling up people who are trained 
uh, to fight. So I'm a little skeptical of that, but I'd be interested to hear from Brian whether he thinks that's that's in the cards and what that would mean politically. Yeah, I, I tend to I tend to agree with what you said about this earlier, Jim. And I think there's both a political aspect to it and the military aspect to it. And politically, I think it would be highly risky uh, because what that would mean, right? If he announced general mobilization, it would mean reservists, right? Men who have served in the military and then left the military and are now in civilian life could be called back into the military and draftees could be deployed to fight uh, in Ukraine. And um, I, I think that's a political problem if they, a potential political problem if they go that route, right? If you imagine yourself a a 30 year old man who you know served in the military eight years ago and now you're told you know you're mobilized for for war in Ukraine and you've got a career, you've got a family, you know that's that's a big lift uh, that I would think the Kremlin would probably want to shy uh, away from if at all possible. And, and then the military side of it is that it's not obvious that these forces, as Jim noted, would be deployable anytime soon, right? You have to uh, train reservists again, organize them in units, do the same with draftees. Uh, a lot of the people who would be doing that in terms of junior officers and that sort of thing are currently fighting in Ukraine. So who is in the rear organizing these troops to, to go to Ukraine? And in what sense would they help on the battlefield if they were if they were deployed. So uh, I think politically it's a risk. I think militarily it doesn't buy them a lot, at least in the short term. But, and here's the big caveat, um, there are lots of things that outside observers thought would not be sensible for Putin to do that he has done. Uh, so I'm not going to rule it out. I, I just don't see how it helps him at this point. unmuting myself now. All right, we're running low on time, so I'm, I'm just going to run through a couple more of these questions. I think we discussed a little bit about the current economic situation in Russia. Um, uh, if anyone wants to address a little more about how big an impact citizens are feeling that and whether they understand why and, and how many are leaving. Um, and then whether you're concerned that that the US and EU countries could over time lose interest, um, uh, relax their efforts uh, on Ukraine. Uh, there's also one politics question about whether you think a possible Trump second term would change the US strategy. Uh, so maybe, you know, combine those questions in some final remarks. I don't know who wants to go first. Or take one, sure. of whichever one you want. <laughs> sure, I, I can get started. Let me just say a few words about the economic situation. Uh, you know, I think there was maybe some uh, misplaced hope that all the sanctions and pressure would have some kind of immediate calamitous effect. And that clearly has not been the case. But my, my sense of it is that over time, if Jim is right, that this war is going to drag on for a while, that they are going to, they, the Russians are going to face increasing problems with production, uh, with supplies, with imports that they need to, to produce both militarily and non-military goods. Uh, and that the risk of a default at some point down the line, if they really do you know, follow through on this uh, oil embargo, as the EU is talking about, uh, I think three to six months, we could see a lot bigger economic effects uh, and some of the initial rally behind the regime might have dissipated. So I think as time goes on, this becomes uh, an increasing not only economic, but political problem for the, for the Russian regime. I'm going to briefly touch on the US, EU, and the Trump piece. Um, I think as long as the Biden administration is in power, I think keeping Europe together with the US on this issue, that's a policy decision. Uh, they've done very well so far. But this is why elections matter. If uh, Trump comes in, it's going to be much more difficult. There was a diversion in the Trump administration between what Trump wanted and what the administration actually did. Um, so you could have some more continuation at the State Department, for example, but as long as you don't have the president trying to, you know, what Biden is doing, bringing the alliance together and Trump actually trying to undermine 
undermine and underfund NATO, then I think it's a it's a problem. But um, I think it's also something that we all watch and and stay active in. And I would just close by saying, Michelle, you know, you you noted that some of the questions wanted to have a comparison with other wars and attention to other wars and. And Brian talked about the meaning of this with respect to territorial aggrandizement. I think, you know, the, the most profound impact in Europe has probably been on the Germans. Um, and, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, it's not great that they, that sort of wars in other places haven't broken through their consciousness, but certainly this one in Europe for them is a big deal that, you know, something they didn't really think would happen again in Europe has happened. And uh, I, while it is hard to maintain unity, the longer this goes on, um, I, I think that that shift in sort of German understanding of what Russia's about and, and the horror of this war, I think does make it uh, easier for the Biden administration to keep allies, especially Germany on board, even though you know, wanting to move beyond this and getting back to some sense of normality would would be something that people might be interested in. But I, I just think there's a recognition that what Russia is doing is just so horrid that uh, horrific that um, I think we'll see the unity continue. The unity continue and the war continue. Unfortunately, it sounds like we're in it for the long haul at the moment. So um, just wanted to, to thank you. We could go on and on and talk. I'm really interested in these topics, uh, as you can see. Um, but our time is up. So I just wanted to thank Brian, Sarah, and Jim for their time today. And thank CMU for organizing this. And thank everyone for, for uh, being here. Thank, thank you. you.